Before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I would like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation Proceedings is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome the new Prime Minister to her place. And I know she will want to ensure that any statements will be made in the House first. We now come to number one, and we start with Paul Hamilton. Paul Letta. Mr. Speaker, I'm honoured to take my place as Prime Minister in this House and to take on responsibility at a vital time for our country. I am determined to deliver for everybody across our United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will work constructively with all members of this House to tackle the challenges we face. Yeah, but... Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I warmly welcome the Prime Minister to her place? Yeah. It's her first PMQ and it's also mine. Yeah. 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 In a leaked audio tape, the Prime Minister is heard saying that British workers need to put in more graft and, they, and, and that they are lacking in skill and application. She also wants to take away their basic workers' rights. In my Erdington constituency, the latest figures from the Commons Library show that children over 7,000 households are living in child poverty and that 68% of those households have working parents. So does the Prime Minister believe that thousands of working parents on low income in my community should just put in more graft? Yeah. Well, I congratulate the Honourable Lady on her first Prime Minister's question. And what I am determined to do as Prime Minister is to make sure we have an economy with high wages, and high skilled jobs. And the way, the way I will achieve that is through reducing taxes on people across our country and boosting economic growth. That is the way that we will make sure we get the investment and the jobs that people deserve. I want to warmly congratulate my right of honourable friend on becoming the third woman Prime Minister. about pubs today. Yeah. A pub restaurant in my constituency in Barnet got in touch with me to say they were struggling to find an energy supplier and the quotes they had got hold of showed that they would be paying a 600% increase in their bill to £320,000. They can't survive that. Will she ensure her plan to tackle the energy price crisis helps businesses in the hospitality sector, which our communities yeah. value so much. Yeah. Well, my right honourable friend is absolutely right. The hospitality industry is vital, and I will make sure in our energy plan that will help support businesses and people with the immediate price crisis, as well as making sure there are long-term supplies available, will help businesses as well as helping yeah. individual households. Yeah. Yeah. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I congratulate the Prime Minister on her appointment? Yeah. When, when, she said, when she said in her leadership campaign that she was against windfall taxes, yeah. did she mean it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Very good. Well, I thank the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman for his welcome. I hope that we will be able to work together, particularly on areas we agree on. And I know that we have had strong support from the opposition in opposing Vladimir Putin's appalling war in Ukraine. And I want us to continue to stand up to that appalling Russian aggression that has led to the energy crisis we face now. 
I am against a windfall tax. I believe it is the wrong thing to be, to be putting companies off investing in the United Kingdom just when we need to be growing the economy. Mr Speaker, uh, thank you for that answer. I ask because the Treasury estimates are that the energy producers will make £170 billion in excess profits over the next two years. The Prime Minister knows she has no choice but to back an energy price freeze. But it won't be cheap, and the real choice, the political choice, is who is going to pay. Is she really telling us that she's going to leave these vast excess profits on the table and make working people foot the bill for decades to come? Well, I understand that people across our country are struggling with the cost of living and they're struggling with their energy bills. And that is why I, as Prime Minister, will take immediate action to help people with the cost of their energy bills. And I will be making an announcement to this House on that tomorrow and giving people certainty to make sure that they are able to get through this winter and be able to have the energy supplies and be able to afford it. But we can't just deal with today's problem. We can't just put a sticking plaster on it. What we need to do is increase our energy supplies long term. And that is why we will open up more supply in the North Sea, which the Honourable Gentleman has opposed. That is why we will build more nuclear power stations, which the Labour Party didn't do when they were in office. And that is why we will get on with delivering the supply as well as helping people through the winter. Well, I look forward to tomorrow's statement, but the money's got to come from somewhere. Uh, and she, she knows that every single pound in excess profits she chooses not to tax is an extra pound on borrowing that working people will be forced to pay back for decades to come. More borrowing than is needed. That's the true cost of her choice to protect oil and gas profits, isn't it? Mr Speaker, the reality is that this country will not be able to tax its way to growth. The way, the way we will grow our economy is by attracting investment, keeping taxes low, delivering the reforms to build projects quicker. That is the way that we will create jobs and opportunities across our country. So, Mr Speaker, her first act as Prime Minister is to borrow more than is needed because she won't touch excess oil and gas profits. On that topic, how much would her planned corporation tax cut hand out to companies? The right honourable gentleman is looking at this in the wrong way. The last time, the last time we cut corporation tax, we attracted more revenue into the Exchequer because more companies wanted to base themselves in Britain. More countries wanted to invest. More companies wanted to invest in our country. And if taxes are put up and raised to the same level as France, which is what the current proposal is, and which I will change as Prime Minister, that will put off investors. It will put off uh, those companies investing in our economy. And ultimately, that will mean fewer jobs, less growth, and less opportunities across our country. Mr Speaker, it's extraordinary that not only is the Prime Minister refusing to extend the windfall tax, She's also choosing to hand the water companies polluting our beaches a tax cut. She's choosing, she's choosing, she's choosing to hand the banks a tax cut. She's choosing to hand the banks a tax cut. Add it all together. And companies that are already doing well are getting a £17 billion tax cut, yeah, yeah. while working people pay for the cost of living crisis, stroke victims wait an hour for an ambulance, and criminals walk the streets with impunity. Families and public services need every penny they can get. 
How on earth does she think that now is the right time to protect Shell's profits and give Amazon a tax break? I'm on the side of people who work hard and do the right thing. That is why we will reverse the national insurance increase and that is why we will keep corporation tax low. Because ultimately, we want investment right across our country. We want new jobs and new opportunities. And that is what I will deliver as Prime Minister. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister claims to be breaking orthodoxy. But the reality is she is reheating George Osborne's failed corporation tax plan, protecting oil and gas profits and forcing working people to pay the bill. She is the fourth Tory Prime Minister in six years. The face at the top may change, but the story remains the same. There is nothing new about the Tory fantasy of trickle-down economics. Nothing new about this Tory Prime Minister who nodded through every single decision that got us into this mess and now says how terrible it is. And can't she see there's nothing new about a Tory Prime Minister who, when asked who pays, says it's you, the working people of Britain? Well, there's nothing new about a Labour leader who is calling for more tax rises. is about reducing taxes, getting our economy growing, getting investment, getting new jobs for people right across the country. I am afraid to say the right honourable gentleman does not understand aspiration. He does not understand opportunity. He does not understand that people want to keep more of it, their own money. and That is what I will deliver as Prime Minister. I will take immediate action to help people with their energy bills, but also secure our long-term energy supply. I will take immediate action to make sure we have lower taxes and we grow the economy. And that way, I will ensure we have a positive future for our country and we get Britain moving. Mr Speaker, and firstly, can I congratulate my right hon. Friend, the, Pri- the Prime Minister, for a successful campaign in to become our party leader and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, it is right and proper that the Government focuses its attention on rising energy costs for households across the country. But as we have heard, businesses big and small are exposed to horrific energy price increases, with no restraint provided by the domestic energy price cap and no support from Government so far. For the sake of businesses in West Cornwall and on Scilly, the jobs they provide and the economy as a whole, what can my friend, the Right Honourable Prime Minister, do to ease energy costs facing our businesses? Well, my my Honourable Friend is right. We do need to address the issues businesses face, and the package that we will be announcing tomorrow will do just that. Leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure the thoughts and prayers of everyone in this House will be with the families that were caught up in the terrible shooting over recess in Kyle and McCalsh and indeed in Liverpool as well. And we trust that the families will be fully supported. Mr. Speaker, let me congratulate the Prime Minister and her family on her appointment. But I'm sorry to say that her reputation for straight talking has fallen apart at the first PMQs. After nine questions, she's still not told us. Who will pay for her energy plan? Prime Minister, today the public are waiting to find out the response to the economic crisis and they want answers. So, will the Prime Minister finally answer two very simple questions? Will she freeze energy prices at their current levels and will it be paid for by a windfall tax? Yes or no? Well, no, it won't be paid for by a windfall tax. I don't believe we can tax our way to growth. And what I want to see is I want to see us using more of our UK energy supply, including 
more oil and gas from the North Sea, and nuclear, and nuclear power in Scotland as well. And I hope I can count on the SNP's support for that. Well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I say that on her first full day as Prime Minister, she has failed to rule out, <coughs> failed to rule out. Shh. Let's hear the next question, Ian Blackford. <laughs> the Prime Minister may have changed, Mr. Speaker, but it's the same old being shouted down by the Tories. <laughs> on her first full day as Prime Minister, she has failed to rule out a trust tax on household and businesses, instead of targeting the profits of massive corporations with a windfall tax. The Prime Minister's plan appears to be a decade-long raid on the bank accounts of ordinary taxpayers. Yep, yep. These costs must not be passed on to consumers and businesses by deferring bills. Here, here. Government must announce an enhanced windfall profits tax, making sure that those oil and gas producers pay their fair share from excess profits. Does the Prime Minister understand that her first act as Prime Minister will now define her. A trust tax that household and businesses will be paying for years to come. Yeah. Well, I'm not quite sure what the uh, honourable, right honourable gentleman's position is, because on one hand, he doesn't seem to want oil and gas extraction from the North Sea, and on the other hand, he wants them to pay more taxes. Oh. Why does he make up his mind? Hey. Chris Lauder. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I also warmly welcome my right honourable friend to uh, her seat as uh, Prime Minister? Uh, Mr. Speaker, Scottish Power, Bulb, and Eon, just three of many energy suppliers that say they provide 100% renewable electricity. Yet constituents of mine in West Dorset are baffled that the energy regulator allows those prices to rise on par with oil and gas. Would my right honourable friend confirm that she is on the side of the consumer in her energy policy that we'll hear from tomorrow? Well, I, I certainly am on the side of consumer, and we need to make sure that we deal with all of the issues in the energy market and the way that energy is regulated. And I will certainly be saying more about this tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Me, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister should know by now that uh, many people in the north of Ireland are starving and freezing in their homes. We need a tailored solution for Northern Ireland, but that's much harder to achieve because the DUP are refusing to form a government at Stormont. The new Prime Minister has a choice to make. She can either be on the side of the DUP or on the side of struggling people in Northern Ireland. So or whose both. side is or she both. on? Well, Mr Speaker, I, I want to work with all of the parties in Northern Ireland to get the Executive and the Assembly back up and running so we can collectively deliver for the people of Northern Ireland. But in order to do that, we do need to fix the issues of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which has uh, damaged the balance between the communities in Northern Ireland. I'm determined to get on with doing that, and I'm determined to work with all parties to find that resolution. Theresa May. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I congratulate my right honourable friend and welcome her to her position yeah. as the third yeah. female yeah. Can I ask my right honourable friend, why does she think it is that all three female Prime Ministers <laughs> have been Conservative? Yeah. My right honourable friend for her fantastic question. I look forward to calling on her advice uh, from her time in office as I start as I start my work as I start my work as Prime Minister. It is it is quite extraordinary, isn't it, that there doesn't seem to be uh, the ability in the Labour Party to find a, uh, a female leader, or indeed a leader who doesn't come from North London. Yeah. I mean, I just,
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I also congratulate the Prime Minister on her appointment? Mr. Speaker, inflation is at a 40 year high. The NHS is on its knees with 6.6 million people waiting for treatment. Thousands of victims are of sexual offences and violent crime are waiting for justice, not to mention passport delays, a summer of chaos in our airports, and our beaches covered in sewage. The Prime Minister has served in every one of the Conservative governments responsible for this mess. So, why should the British public trust her? to clean up the mess that she's helped create. Yeah. I'm determined that we deal with the issues facing us as a nation. We do have problems with our energy supply due to the appalling war being perpetrated by Putin in Ukraine. That is why I will take immediate action to deal with the energy crisis. My Chancellor will take immediate action to reduce taxes and make sure we are growing our economy. And our new Health Secretary, who is also the Deputy Prime Minister, yeah. will be taking immediate action to make sure people are able to get appointments with their GP and proper NHS services. Father of the House, Sir Peter Bottomley. Yeah. All sides of the House should wish to help the Prime Minister be successful in tackling the problems facing yeah. the country. Yeah. Yeah. When I raised one of them with the former Prime Minister in July, he said I could talk to the Housing Minister, but the Housing Minister retired after 17 minutes of hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask the Prime Minister to look to see why the Planning Inspectorate are able to overturn Council's planned protections for green lungs, and will she look at what's happening to the Goring Gap, the A259, in Worthing West and in South Downs constituency, because local councils have no role if they can't protect what matters most to them. Yeah. 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 Well, I am a bit concerned about offering the honourable gentleman a meeting with the housing minister <laughs> in, case, in case any ill should befall, uh, should befall him. But uh, look, my, my honourable friend is right. Uh, there is not enough power in local hands at the moment. It is too easy for local councils to be overruled by the planning inspectorate, and that is certainly an issue that I am expecting my Secretary of State to, for Housing to look at. Anna Bardell. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. According to the Prime Minister's new Deputy Prime Minister, one of the things that qualified her most for being PM and was one of her greatest achievements was the reintroduction of beavers. Now, I'm all for the beavers, but given her flip-flopping on Brexit and given her inability to understand global affairs, how can constituents like mine, like Waz Abbas, whose energy prices are going to go from seven to £37,000 a year, or Broadtext in Livingston, who are going to go from fifty to £250,000 a month, have any faith that she can tackle the oncoming humanitarian crisis? Is she going to come out of her den in number 10 and take real action, or is she going to be as useless and corrupt as her predecessor, who's rocketed off to somewhere in the Pacific. Well, I, I am determined to tackle the issues we face in energy, and I look forward uh, to the Scottish Government playing their part by building new nuclear power stations. Can I, can I just say, I want a nice opponent, that was not a good example. I certainly don't want the use corrupt being used against the new Prime Minister, and I'm sure the Honourable Member. Just I'm sure the wrong one, but we'll withdraw it. Just withdraw the call. Sometimes, sometimes the truth hurts, but I'm happy to withdraw it. Pretty much sure. Right. Victoria Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I warmly congratulate my right honourable friend? May I welcome her to her place? But may I also wish her the very best in the heavy responsibilities mm. she now bears. Yeah. Around one and a half million households across the countryside rely on heating oil yeah. in order to keep their homes warm Absolutely. and to cook their meals. They have faced price rises of around 130% in recent months, and they are not part of the energy price yeah. cap. Exactly. As rumours abound about what tomorrow's statement may hold, Will my right honourable friend confirm that those one and a half million households, many of them in rural areas such as my own constituency, will be specifically included in any mooted ideas about an energy price freeze? Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
Well, my, my honourable friend is right, and many of my constituents too uh, rely on heating oil uh, for their fuel, and we need to make sure that we are looking after everybody in this very, very difficult winter that we're facing. Martin Day. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Members may be familiar with the work of Bones firm Ballantyne's Castings, an iron foundry in operation since the 1820s, which in recent years has done much work around the parliamentary estate. Without the protection of an energy price gap, this specialist SME is witnessing unaffordable costs with bills rising from 13,000 to 120,000 per month. Heavy energy users face a disproportionate burden and clearly need more support than other businesses. What will the PM do to protect our strategically important and energy intensive industries? Well, the, uh, I very strongly agree with the honourable gentleman that there are strategic industries that we need to make sure who use a lot of energy. You know, we need to do all we can to help them become more energy efficient but we also need to make sure that they are able to remain competitive in the global marketplace, and that is certainly something the Energy Secretary is looking at in preparing this package. Dr Kieran Mullen. Yeah, 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 yeah. I congratulate the Prime Minister on her appointment and tell her I know my constituents wanted to succeed at a difficult time. Yeah. Outside of the immediate challenges of energy and inflation, levelling up remains a priority for them. One way to demonstrate her commitment to levelling up would be to choose a town like Crewe to host Great British Railways. Can, can, can she ensure that levelling up is at the heart of that decision? Well, Crewe is, of course, a great railway town. Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right. I'm not going to prejudge the decision that will be made, but what I will be doing as Prime Minister is absolutely focusing on levelling up and making sure we're attracting the investment in, and growth into parts of this country that have been left behind so they have their fair share of opportunity. Alex Davis Jones. Mr Speaker, the new Prime Minister is now finally imposed. But make no mistake, she does not have the support of the British public. She can't even rely on the backing of her own MPs. And people in Pontypridd will never forget that she played a key role in a government that failed millions. So will she now finally do the right and decent thing and call a general election? Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker you know, as, a, as a country, we are facing a very serious crisis in energy caused by Putin's war in Ukraine. We are facing. Oh, order, order. One of the members for Stoke is getting very carried away. And I know as a former teacher he wants to show better behaviour than he's showing at the moment. Come on, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are, we are facing very serious issues as a country, uh, uh, partly as a result of the aftermath of COVID, partly as a result of Putin's war in Ukraine. What the British people want is they want a government that's going to sort it out. Yeah. And that is what. That is what I'm determined to do as Prime Minister, sort out the energy crisis, get our economy going, make sure people can get doctor's appointments. That's what I'm focused on. Nick Fletcher. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to congratulate my honourable friend for the uh, position as Prime Minister, but I would also like to thank her for the support of my campaign to keep Doncaster Sheffield Airport yeah. open. Help further right into South Yorkshire Mayor Oliver Coppard and Peel Holdings Chairman John Whitaker to remind them of their powers, duties, and responsibilities yeah, yeah. to the people of South Yorkshire and yeah, beyond. Yeah, yeah. Well and will she use the full weight of her office on these decision makers so as to keep our Doncaster Sheffield Airport open? Yeah. Yeah. Well, regional airports, including the Doncaster Sheffield Airport, are a vital part of our economic growth. And what I will make sure is that the new Transport Secretary is immediately onto this issue. Uh, I, know, I know she is. I can tell. Look, she's already contacting. She's already contacting the people in Doncaster and Sheffield to make sure we do protect this airport and we protect those that vital infrastructure and connectivity that helps our economy grow. Helen Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd also like to welcome the Prime Minister to her new post. 
During her leadership campaign, she said that waiting times for ambulances in her rural Norfolk constituency were appalling. And in North Shropshire, I think many of my constituents would agree with that statement. Across Britain, waiting hours and hours for an ambulance has become normal. But instead of focusing on this problem, a leadership fiasco in the Conservatives have seen three health secretaries in three months. Will the Prime Minister get a grip on this grave situation and commission the CQC into investigating the causes of and the solutions to the ambulance services delays before the service in crisis faces the additional pressures of an oncoming winter? People should not have to wait as long as they are for ambulance services. And my new health secretary is immediately tackling this issue. She's already laid out her priorities and sorting out the ambulance service is one of them. Dame Caroline Dynage. Speaker, can I also very warmly welcome our new Prime Minister to her role and indeed the, uh, the whole of her front bench. This is September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, and as she knows, um, cancer is still the biggest killer of children under the age of 14. So I wonder if she could restate her government's commitment to publish a cancer 10-year strategy, but also embedding a childhood cancer mission at its very heart. Well, Mr. Speaker, cancer is a devastating disease, and it's particularly heartbreaking uh, when children. Um, children have cancer and certainly uh, we will proceed with the strategy uh, that she talks about and I know our new health secretary will do all she can to help those children with cancer. Sir Tony Lloyd. Thank you Mr Speaker. On the theme of children, she will know from her time as Children's Minister that young lungs uh, exposed to cold and damp housing are more likely to fall seriously ill and possibly die. Now, child poverty has been growing during her ministerial time in, in her different offices. Will she give a solemn pledge and no evasion that there will be no child that will go to bed in a cold, damp house this winter and beyond because the parents cannot afford to put the heating on? Yeah. Yeah. But this, this is why it's so important that we do tackle uh, the issue of energy. And I will make sure that people are able to afford their energy bills at the same time as dealing with the long-term supply issues to make sure that we are resilient in energy and never get into this position again. Mr Speaker, it is the standard practice of the European Union that when they can't get their way in negotiations with the UK, they play for time and wait for a new leader who they hope will have a different view to their predecessor. For the sake for the sake of clarity, would my right honourable friend confirm that it is the UK's preferred option to have a, a negotiated settlement as far as the Northern Ireland Protocol is concerned? But if that is not forthcoming, then we will proceed with the Protocol Bill that is currently going through Parliament. Well, well first of all, can I thank my right honourable friend for his service as Northern Ireland Secretary. He is absolutely right. We need to resolve the issue of the Northern Ireland Protocol. My preference is for a negotiated solution, but it does have to deliver all of the things we set out in the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. And what we cannot allow is for this situation to drift, because my number one priority is protecting the supremacy of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Rachel Hopkins. The new Prime Minister tells us she will deliver on the NHS. Well, that's a turn up for the books, because after 12 years of Conservatives driving our NHS into the ground, we have record waiting lists, people dying in ambulances outside A&E, and nurses using food banks. So given the Prime Minister has served in the past three Conservative governments on that watch, can she explain why we should trust her to deliver? I mean, I don't agree with the way she is talking down our National Health Service. The fact, is, the fact is that our health service did brilliantly in tackling COVID, in delivering the vaccine rollout and in getting this country back on its feet. But we do face challenges now with the backlog following COVID. And this is why the new Health Secretary is going to work to address those challenges. Jeremy Wright. Thank you very much. 
Speaker, I congratulate my right honourable friend on her appointment and recognise her determination to address the many urgent and difficult challenges that face us now. But would she accept that one of those challenges is an almost entirely unregulated online space? And would she accept, too, that no responsible government can avoid the need for excellent, balanced, sensible regulation in this space? And would she therefore assure me that the online safety bill will come back to this House swiftly for us to consider further and amend if necessary? Well, I can assure my honourable friend that we will be proceeding uh, with the online safety bill. There are some issues that we need to deal with. What I want to make sure is that we protect uh, the under 18s from harm, but we also make sure free speech uh, is allowed. So there may be some tweaks required, but certainly he is right that we need to protect people's safety online. Hello, Days. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister has been part of a government for the past 12 years, which has been systematically letting down the most vulnerable children in the country. The Independent Review of Children's Social Care, published by the government in May, describes the system as in need of a total reset. The Prime Minister has said she wants to deliver. Will she make a cast-iron commitment to deliver for our country's most vulnerable children and publish the government's response to the independent review and an action plan for delivery before the end of the year? Yes or no? Here. Yes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to congratulate my right honourable friend and her whole front bench and wish them every success in the new government. I'd particularly like to, to thank my right honourable friend for her steadfast commitment to support for the earliest years. Throughout the 12 years that she and I have worked together for three previous Prime Ministers. So can I ask her now to renew her commitment to rolling out the best start for life to give every baby the best chance at leading a fulfilling life? Prime Minister. My, my right honourable friend has done such a fantastic job championing this issue, developing the policies, and I am committed to following through and delivering for children because what we know is intervening early, helping children early, is the best way to help those children have a successful childhood and ultimately a fulfilled life. That ends PMQs.